Life is a constant state of change. At our most basic level, we are cells dying and multiplying to fill the gaps, each one presenting minuscule changes and mutations which may only be felt over the course of an entire lifetime, but are nonetheless, mostly unbeknownst to us, changing our very beings. To live, we must be in a state of biological change, and the same is true of our larger, intentional structures, ourselves and our societies. How do you feel about who you were 10 years ago? Maybe even 5? Just 2? And your future goals, will you need to adapt to accomplish them? Can you be the same person until the day you die? This change is one of the core themes of Arcane, a story very much centered around the conflict of change. It presents those who made the worlds they now live in, and their next generations who want to live in the worlds of their own choosing, a state which is destined to cause endless tension. But in this is something which feels much more subtle and sinister, something which sneaks up on us, mimicking that change in the conflict surrounding us within our very own beings. It is a story of manipulation, of blindness, of a total fall from grace, and one I think we can learn a lot from to be aware of our own changes and how to control that inevitable factor, as well as my own personal excessive fears, change. It is the story that probably seems the least likely for me to cover in one that has villains monologuing and crazy characters, but today we're talking about Jace Talos. But to do that, we first have to discuss Mel and what she means to the story. Mel represents one of my greatest fears and probably one of the least likable things about knowing me personally. A fear of excess, of pleasure, power, and their spoils because of how it can lead to change. A Noxian aristocrat, Mel is the disowned heir of the ruling family there, the Medardas. Her status as Piltover's richest resident is dwarfed by every single other member of the family, and her exiled status is due to her lack of direct cutthroat ability. Her weapon, unlike the blades of her mother, is much more subtle and graceful, an aspect represented in their contrary designs. Mel's mother is utilitarian, wearing armor, the sections of skin which show through are covered in scars, and gray hair proving age is unadorned. Mill's entire wardrobe is one designed to be excessive contrarily. Every open space where jewelry could be, it is. Her hair, which is seen to come undone at night, is carefully styled and maintained each day with makeup with precise and unique flourishes, gold everywhere, and only the most comfortable articles of clothing. She is rich, but that aspect alone is not enough. It must make her great, and so it must be visible and recognizable to all. On the other hand, when you look at her mother, you'd assume that maybe she's a warrior when you consider the armed guards and status probably a general, but she's the leader of one of the most powerful and wealthy nations to exist. This duality goes down to the main color of their outfits even. Her mothers are red and black, and I don't think I really need to explain why she has red all over her hands. Mel usually swaps between black and white dresses as if to show her conflict the way she manipulates from the shadows under the veil of purity. It's one proven by action and one trying to be proven by show. This doesn't say that her mother is correct or better in any way, a ruthless warmonger who's willing to cut off the head of a child or an entire city alike for her own gain. And her harsh standards, as well as her own fear of weakness driving this cruelty, is what motivates Mel to act as she does. Nothing was enough, so she must have more. She is an embodiment in design and development alike of excess. And in that, she is a commentary on wealth and power. Nothing is ever enough. To quote someone we should all thank God for, some money isn't enough. They want all the money. When we look at someone of this status who can have this exchange, You are the richest person in Piltover. Oh, yet I remain the poorest Madada. The point is quite clear. The method to personal value and happiness is not built on wealth and excessive material possession, but we cover that all the time, and if you don't understand how the Council's monetary corruption is instrumental to the terrible events of the series, then I don't think anything I say will make the point more clear than the already in-your-face arcane. But this personal insight isn't 
what gives me a fear of excess and the kind of hatred you love to feel for a well-developed character. I don't fear excess out of the idea that one day I'll achieve it myself, look around an empire and think I'm still not happy. In fact, that's something I actively don't want or understand. If I was Mel, I wouldn't be worried about status and its utility as proof of myself. I'd be happy about being able to wake up and paint my emotions out because that privilege is what I care about. The ability to live one's life as they choose, to do something I love and go to sleep satisfied with it. I care about ideas, not things. I stress myself out about video essays day and nights and being able to provide them at a consistent time and level when I can easily make other forms of content because this is the value I always found lacking in the world around me. These thoughts of abstract concepts of better societies for the true definition of right and wrong. Once I was introduced to them, I was addicted to them, and I found them nowhere around me. I was lost with blurred vision in a blocked path, completely unclear where I'd be going, only feeling alone and cold and desperate, and I wanted to make a world where no one would have to feel that way again. I describe it this way to develop a somewhat clumsy mirror to the situation Jace's story begins within. He and his mother are caught in a snowstorm, entirely isolated from any assistance or warmth, except the small amount one person can provide the other. His mother takes the brunt of this, holding her arms around him despite not having gloves herself. Frostbitten and weary, she collapses, death impending at any moment, while Jace calls for help, and somehow is answered. A mage appears from the storm, reveals a magic stone, and uses its power to cast away the snow and reveal a lively, hopeful meadow. Struck by wonder, Jace is left with the stone, something he wears on his person and holds in moments of doubt, but he's also left with a new lease on life. He dedicates it to the thing which saved it, magic. When we find him outside of this flashback, he's a student at the Royal Academy, the favored patron of the Kiriman clan who have a counselor matriarch and pupil to the city's head and part founder and also council member Heimerdinger. Part of the Talos family, he's well off due to their development of cutting edge tools, and you could see that Jace was quite secure in life. A path of comfort and easy days was open to him from his birthright, and at any moment he could have relied on that safety net of his family. And yet, he chases magic instead, hoping to harness that power he was saved by and then further present that salvation for others to take. His motivation for the development of these magic stones, later what's known as Hextech, is to adapt his family's purpose, making new and more powerful tools which better the lives of the everyday citizen. Instead of breaking their backs in the mines, powered gauntlets and portable lasers would do the hard work, leaving them more time and energy for the things that really matter in life. Everything his class provides him is poured into his research. An academy enrollment gets him materials and knowledge, the money from the Kiramin's unauthorized tools, and the comfort of his family name and status, enough time to tinker away in a quiet apartment, working so diligently that his food remains on the counter next to his work, completely untouched. Not even to mention that working in secrecy as he does, since his research is very unauthorized, every development which is done, at least until Victor joins is fully his, from theoretical calculations to physical builds. He's even working with a material so dangerous that dropping one can destroy a whole building, and all that time he never has one accident of his own fault. Of course, Powder's accident kicks off an investigation into his work as she and Vi were caught sneaking in to prove themselves in their own way, forming the other side of this narrative that hopefully we'll cover one day. Almost caught, the two and their friends are forced to flee, and one of these stones tumbles around again and again, its unstable nature eventually bursting and tearing down the building with it. This culminates in a trial, an almost banishment reduced to school expulsion by desperate pleas, near self-removal from the world stopped only by a reward for his passion, and an eventual last-ditch effort with potential heavy consequences to steal back and finish his soon-to-be-destroyed research with his new partner who saved him, Victor. He's that driven that even with comfort galore, without his work and with no potential to gain anything similar again since he was banned from the academy, 
he still wishes to cease being, and then when he doesn't, he risks it all again. His value is not the value of a comfortable life, but rather one he chose himself, the betterment he hopes to provide in his contribution to the world more than just labor. It is the meaning behind all of this. It's ironic he and Nell end up together given they stand as such opposites here. She shows us that the trappings of excess will fail us, and Jace begins to present the other extreme. What will happen when ideals decide who we are? So how did they end up together then? Well, the answer is complex, but summed up in one word, manipulation. And to be clear, it is at least in part manipulation. Mel is perfectly fine with referring to Jace as an investment, and his advancements were something to put Piltover on the map for her own personal gain as she sought to seek status and be accepted back into her own family. We see at the end that she is, she once again wears the ring bearing their insignia. Maybe there is love and care in there as well, but it doesn't change the origins. And that summary is why I fear excess power and pleasure that she represents, because in part she, those ideas, takes someone so idealistic and ready to help the world and change them, turn them into this. A screaming, bigoted, selfish person who isn't even a shadow of their former goals. How? Well, Mel is something Jace hardly knew. While he had personal comfort and stability at any time, she's a different world of both pleasure and expectations. To get deeper into the expectations side, let's first look at his family. Overall, they're really quite the working class success story, a toolmaker who rose to prominence by making the jobs of people just like them easier. They provide the means for people to live out what you could call the Piltover dream, not endless riches, not fame or fortune, but stability. Instead of a seat at the council, it's a seat at a table full of food and surrounded by family. The basic ideals of a common life. The Talos family establishes the means for perfectly ordinary lives to happen. And his mother is accepting of those to no end. She speaks up to help get Jace's exile downgraded to expulsion from the academy and is pleased when she succeeds because that means her son will still be able to live a long and healthy and happy life even if he has to change his dreams. He always has that baseline, at least the good common life. She doesn't expect him or want him to change the world. That desire is one he developed and placed on himself. His role model Heimerdinger is similar. When Jace and Victor show endless ambition, he encourages it at a reasonable pace and under strict controls, of course. Changing the world takes time, and like his story about the Academy's founder, sometimes it's not about changing the world, but simply laying the foundation for it to be done in the future, quite in line with the ideals of Jace's background, provide the tools to change the world. This is all another contrast to Mel, who enters the scene contradicting his mother and his mentor. Now, this is after a time skip where Jace and Victor succeeded last minute at creating Hextech, and years in the future, Jace is now a celebrated and beloved inventor who took Piltover into a veritable golden age by creating the Hexgates, methods of hypertransportation requested by the council, making Piltover the trading capital of the world. Quite the pedigree, so here's how Heimerdinger and Mel react to his wanting to present helpful, but unfinished technology at the upcoming last minute progress day address, the 200th in the city's history. Quite amazing, gentlemen. Obviously, there are a few kinks to iron out, but give it a decade of careful research and it will be ready. Piltover needs a leader who looks forward. Someone like you. It's your speech. Give the people a glimpse of the future. And when Jace goes with his mentor over Mel's advice, she takes after her mother and reacts coldly, leaving the front row quite obviously and quite upset. Around this same time, it's learned that the hex gates are being used for smuggling, and the theft of a new hex tech development results in the lost lives of six enforcers. This presents hex tech as a danger to stability and safety, and so Jace desires to put his purpose on hold, halting all hex tech activities for safety's sake. He's making the sacrifice of everything which defines his life. So what does Mel do? 
She makes him a counselor to oversee their safety instead, only putting more on an already full and stressed out plate. When he can't handle that plate and makes unwise political moves, she shows him how to play politics to manage it. When that power he kept gaining leads to him ousting his own mentor Heimerdinger and becoming de facto head of the council even more responsibility, she says it was right and what needed to be done. She is always there, pushing him along and subtly saying more, more, more. Exactly what she represents. The latter half of Arcane is full of scenes of Jace cracking under this constantly evolving pressure. It almost invokes some sympathy for Heimerdinger, the former head of the council, for how he never showed the strain of the work. He was always upbeat and energetic, and one of the few who seemed delighted and motivated by the job, not simply a cynical moron driven by profit. Jace, in contrast, loathes every second of it, in over his head and learning tasks on the fly, a politician instead of the scientist he wanted to be. We can judge his foolishness in deferring to extreme and immediate solutions like closing down the bridges, suggested as the only way to curtail weapons being taken into Piltover from the Undercity, but in reality cutting them off their most vulnerable citizens and stoking tensions when they were already heightened. But we also must know that we have done the same under pressure, we just didn't have the same stakes. It's like the errant frames of an anime, the bugs or half-baked mechanics of a video game, the sloppily thrown together burger, or the terribly delivered package. We all have duties that we sometimes can't fulfill, whether from pressure, a lack of love for the work, or both at once, and a lot of other factors. Isn't Jace's situation just this on a larger scale? He's slowly stolen away from what he actually desires by the pressures of a role he didn't ask for, but had to fulfill. One that keeps presenting him with more and more problems, having less and less time to address what's already there. He takes the simple solution offered by Marcus, jumps to drastic action offered by Vi, because once the pressure starts, it never stops. Like Mel's desire, the thing which began and drove this arc of his pressure, it's never enough. Yeah, you helped to build up this city. What have you done for me right now? It's the same logic he himself uses to oust Heimerdinger. He becomes the weak, ineffective politician who used to hold him back from his desire. Pressure forms us like this. It takes raw material and compresses it into the shape of the mold it's placed into. It's terrifying because it inherently produces change, and the ideas we have to better the world were grown and molded by us and what we felt. They're a product of ourselves and our situation, not the one that we're currently in the one we're being molded to. Jace is a man of science, so let's explain it with an admittedly oversimplified equation. This one right here. Ideals equals us times pressure. If our ideals are a constant that we'll hold fast to no matter what, and our pressures are mostly independent of us, that is, they'll change without our consent, then if the pressures on us change, the only thing which can compensate for that and take the full brunt of that change is us. But when we only see ourselves as our ideals, as Jace does, then will we ever even recognize this change? We're looking at the solution of the equation and seeing the same thing as always, even as the other half of it manipulates. Power is inherent to this as well, because power is the necessity of change. To accomplish great things, one must have the desire and motivation to do great things, but they also must have the means to do great things. Ideas, the stuff of Jace's self-worth, are beautiful, captivating, good to look at and think about, good to speak about with others who understand them, but untouchable on their own, seen as beautiful from afar like an impressionist work showcasing more of a feeling, not really the reality of a scene. We must do the work to create that physical aspect of ideas. They are difficult and intense to create, to describe, and to explain. Meanwhile, power, the way to turn ideas into reality, is alluring. It is also beautiful and captivating, but it's good to touch and feel. It's right there, not seen from afar, but in our faces saying, look at me. Power is like Mel's seduction of Jace. It's there, it's bold, you can touch it and feel it and see the effects and the pleasure directly. How vivid are your memories of pleasure? Can you bring back that feeling, the way their hands ran across you, the words they said, the anticipation and expectation? Their face is something you can probably see quite vividly, right? 
but picture instead the world you want to live in. What do you see? How complex is it to explain? It probably requires detailed and long descriptions, explanations of why and how and how it all connects. Can you make someone else understand how you feel about kindness inherently? Ideals are mostly complex, but pleasure is mostly simple. Both will have times where they are not, but their base levels are these. And who isn't drawn to such immediate and gratifying feelings? They can take us over in an instant, as they so clearly did to Jace. Something I love about the day after they share a night is when he returns the next day and damn near instantly starts being all kinds of lovey-dovey with her. He's kissing her hand and laying on her lap, something that even seems to shock Mel. As if to say, really? This much? This quick? I took that big of a place in your world that you come to me when a friend who saved your life is dying? That you would say, anything feels possible when I'm with you? Victor is Jace's work, quite literally a representation of the people he hopes to help, and Mel is his pleasure. The second he has the latter, he spends so much less time with the former. He speaks so much about being pulled away from his dream, but those complaints are always going to the person actually pulling him away from it, the one directing him to responsibilities he never asked for. Once we know pleasure, we often don't go back. Jace spent most of his younger years working away, seen again in how quickly he clings on to Mel. This is new to him, exciting and bold. Who wants to be in a stuffy lab with half-eaten sandwiches all day after they've known the captivation of personal intimacy? Even if you do return, it's at least a distraction, a forbidden fruit adding to the mind and pulling its attention away from the other matters. This is why excess and pleasure scare me. Because ideas of betterment are difficult, they're ruthless and grueling, they're long hours and commitment, they're consuming and difficult to achieve. But pleasure? Pleasure is so often relaxed and simple. To contemplate why one lives life through hundreds of pages could only be done on a full stomach and under a roof, and the food to fill that stomach is a pleasure as well, at a much more basic and easy to understand level than achieving the purpose of life one is contemplating. It requires no contemplation, no care, just action. That is dangerous to me, how easy it is, how it takes no consideration because we don't have to give it any. We won't notice when we're taken by pleasure because we so often do not consider it, while our ideas are consideration itself. The equation grows more complex. Suddenly its ideals are us times pressure times pleasure. We add another factor mostly independent of our choice, leaving us to take even more brunt for those ideals to remain the same. We got quite a bit sidetracked from power there into pleasure, which we came into because of pressure, but I think that mixture really shows another danger in all of this. It's not possible to fully separate all of these concepts out and say exactly, this is it, this is why I have changed, which is part of how easily they can change us. Without a pinpoint, something to direct our attention, it's harder to notice what we've become. We may even see some of the changes, but not the full picture because of this. I mean, Jace remarks multiple times that he hates politics as he plays savvy political games, how he thinks he may have to do something he never wanted to, but then does it anyway. They look like singular events, odd occurrences, not the things which define our character. But how are we defined if not by the sum of actions we take? Can we really rely on intent and ideal, things so incommunicable? Maybe they can define us inside, but the way we affect the world isn't just how we feel about ourselves, it's how the world feels about us, what we'll do to make those ideals defining us into reality. This is where we reach power properly again. Jace and Victor are originally nearly caught sneaking into Heimer Digger's lab, last ditch effort to complete their research, saved only by Mel hearing out his pleas for a future driven by Piltover's glory and distracting the security guard. He's only able to prevent excessive oversight and direction by seat on the council, which Mel suggested and provided. He's only able to do as he pleases for Victor's sake because he ousts Heimerdinger, who was threatening to shut down their research, with Mel's support. Mel is power, and power was needed for Jace to succeed. But this feeds itself in a cycle. 
A good idea requires power, improving the idea requires more, spreading it even more, and so on, to achieve the goal of helping others at a scale he wished he was always going to be subjected to a seductive, self-justifying force. It's okay to take power when you're going to use it for good, right? It's okay because you're improving lives with it. It's okay because someone wanted to stop you, but you're trying to do good and so you need it. It's okay because you have to. Have to. That phrase is the key. Like a rearing of the sunken costs fallacy, there's a danger in changing the whole world around your ideals when your ideals are your life. In that situation, will you ever willingly give it up? Maybe before you could truly start. Maybe if it's taken away from you before you have power. But here, now, once he started, once he has power, it can be taken away by no one. The council allowed a monster to grow for their own profit, and it's much too powerful and too far along to be halted by anyone. This gets into something that's probably obvious to everyone, but felt like a notes app revelation to me a few years back when I was researching a lot of history for videos and finding so many bloody leaders of revolutions with ideals I technically agreed with. I wondered if someone believed all of these things, the things that make me feel like a decent person, how could they become such brutal dictators? How could they spill so much blood for an idea that I think makes me a good person? Well, to quote the series itself, that is the base violence necessary for change. People may not understand what your ideal world is, and you will likely not be able to express it to them in any simple way, and we will all be much too tired and much too distracted and much too exhausted to hear out these long, lengthy descriptions and time-consuming processes needed to communicate what your ideal world would be. But with force, you can make them live in it. And when you're under pressure, as we said, the simple options become so clear. Once they're living in your world, they'll understand it, right? So force it through. Simplicity breeds complacency, and in complacency we lose our ideals, which are so complex. Ideals equals us times present times pleasure times power. You know the song and dance by now. Another mostly independent factor we can't control and our ideals we refuse to shift. We change while thinking we stay the same based on this. Excess in its spoils, pleasure, power, and pressure, they're terrifying to me because I, like Jason, someone built up around my ideals and my goals. If we consider the two the same, we're even more staunch because goals, unlike abstract concepts, are solid and concrete and easy to understand and thus easier to hold without change and without consideration. I want to analyze and tell stories because they were my method of finally feeling free of my own mental prison and I saw how better I could become through them, how much I could do through them. Once I was introduced to the process of contemplation for one's own sake, I was addicted. It became my world and almost every video I've ever produced has simply been me working through these and my emotions, pouring them out onto the internet in a desperate attempt to understand them, screaming and hollering about living by better ideals and who I am and everything. I started putting more and more time and dedication into it, weeknights and weekends, early mornings and late nights, setting aside so much pleasure all the time because what if I got addicted to it and then suddenly I didn't want to do this anymore? It is my life. I do everything for this because it's the way I feel I can add value to the world and to myself and so live a valuable life as me. It is my hex tech, the concrete goal which rests in abstract desires. The dream is why I wake up and why I sleep. If I only worked a 9 to 5, I'm quite convinced I would have given in to the vices which have so often tried to or did kill my family at this point. The ones which left me so alone for so long as they tore up the ones who should have cared for me. I would be doing nothing but repeating the mistakes of the past willingly. Pleasure feels like a slippery slope to me. One that I can see the bottom of, and that I don't like one bit. The bottom doesn't look exactly like Jace's story. He has more power than I do or ever will, and that inherently changes the equation. But the sentiment remains. We believe that we won't change because of strong ideals. Because they are us, they provide us a path, meaning concrete goals to keep them and us grounded and give us knowledge of who we are in simple terms. We say, I am this goal, I am these ideals, even if it's hard to explain them. But then, 
Those things which we thought secured us become the very agents of our change. They overtake us, and the person is just a goal with a mismatched host bind to anything that matters. Victor is what showcases this for Jace. To repeat a short statement from earlier, Victor is representative of what Jace wanted to fix in a better world. Coming from the Undercity, Victor was a sickly child, and into his adulthood as well, later revealed to be in part from toxic gases where he grew up, a condition which drives him closer to death every day even now. It's all summed up quite directly here. I think it has something to do with gases in the fissures where he grew up. Exactly the sort of thing we wanted to fix with Hextech. He's someone who never had a chance, plucked away only by chance itself when Heimerdinger saw his potential, but then locked him to the role of an assistant. By no fault of his own, he could only advance with the power of others. Jace promised to be that power, to be that help, eschewing his own easy comfort, easy life for a much harder one of doing just that. I bring this all up because what drives his actions at the end of the series is saving Victor's life. His partner has a vision and makes it come true. The hex core, an adapting organic hex tech which reacts to biological matter. It can take twigs and turn them into full trees right before their eyes, but it always ends in the death of the specimen. He reasons, however, that if it is perfected, it could prolong life, including his own. Jace understands this fact and decides that they should push forward with it at all costs, even against the safety he was put in charge of, even against his mentor who recognizes its danger and wants it destroyed. Jace was once willing to shut down everything, his whole life in the name of caution, but now he's full speed ahead with little concern. This is where Jace loses sight of his good intent and begins acting on selfish desires. Instead of helping the Undercity, he's helping the technology that might help one of the residents of it. So far gone from that understanding, he has the exchange with Victor where he says that everyone from the Undercity is dangerous, and Victor says that he's one of them. How could this be that in trying to save that which represents his ideals, he becomes someone so against them? It's because of our equation. He was looking at the result, the end of his actions, the goal, the they will understand the force once it pays off of it all. Looking so heavily right there, he never noticed that the other unconsented factors were manipulating who he really was. By defining himself around goal and ideal, he lost anything good enough to even carry those in the first place. Anything which would have made him stay true to them. And then, in one of the harshest truths I'll ever put in simple terms, he's lucky enough to kill a kid. There's not much that would have helped him see once again after how far he was corrupted by power, manipulated by pleasure, and coerced by pressure, but that, that's something which always will. He got there because of Mel's mother and Vi alike, who convinced him that on the precipice of disaster between the under and over cities, direct action, force, is necessary. Silco is stoking tensions, and his power needs to be taken away, coming in the form of Shimmer, the drug which enhances one's abilities temporarily and at a steep cost. It both gives him his soldiers and also allows him to keep everyone complacent under his boot. And so Jace turns Hextech into weapons, launching an assault and losing himself in the battles. Overwhelmed, he wants to blast his problems away and be done with it. That's exactly the reason he's here right now, to simply blast away the problems, and a child is caught in his mad, unaware crossfire. Recognizing how far he's fallen once the blood is on his hands, not on the hands of others he oppressed and forced to take direct action themselves, he changes his mind on such forceful action and instead wants to back out just as they began. It leads to this conversation. Do you not understand? I am part of this now. You've always been a part of this. You just never had to look it in the eye. One dead kid? There's hundreds more where he came from. He leaves without a fight despite the argument and returns topside to contemplate this new awareness. Once again, it's shown by Victor, but this time in actually seeing him once more. His partner is at his lowest, the Hex Corps having claimed the life of Sky, an assistant who admired him, and he was unable to destroy it himself in sort of revenge. He stands as Jace did all those years ago when Victor interrupted him, 
with the same intent in mind. And Jace repays the favor with the exact same line. Am I interrupting you? This is more than just a cute callback to the beginning of the series. It's Jace finally seeing his friend and all the pain he ignored, noticing him in full and doing something which will eventually actually help him for once. He even commits to destroying the Hexcourt Victor's wish, despite having done everything, everything he just did to push it forward and knowing that doing so means losing his partner. But he's not acting for himself, for others anymore, he's just acting for them directly and so what's best for them. Like Jace, Victor became a monster for his goals, and the only thing they can do now is step back and witness their damage. And Vi's statement is the encapsulation of another aspect of blindness by goal, and the last one to discuss before we see how he turns that awareness into good action for his last powerful decision. Jace spent a lot of time brooding about how much he hated politics, all of the trade disputes and shady underdealings required, and all of that hatred for it is valid. But he began using all of that power for corrupt ways to chase the goal he was always so confident was his only way to help the world. Everything he did, he did for Hextech. But as a counselor, couldn't he have done more direct means of salvation? It's clear that the one time he did try and do his job with goodwill and dutiful intent, he was punished for it, as his increased regulations on trade ticked off the other council members, and this would have made him less effective as a politician. But even so, performing all of these council actions in the name of Hextech, in the name of helping other people, adds an additional layer. Why not remove the middle, remove Hextech? Why does the help for them have to come through this? Why couldn't he make those shady dealings to instead reform the Undercity, claiming that better actions there would increase the profits of the Council? There was another path that was exceptionally clear, literally right there for him, that he was forced into, spelled out by his mentor speaking about the Academy's founder, that sometimes the best thing for the world is when our goals change. And he misses it. He misses it entirely. That is, until the end. Maybe Vi's words hit him just enough because his final act is one which rectifies all of the problems and acts as penance, at least as much as possible. He strikes up a deal with Silco, giving up much more than is technically equal for little in return, even allowing the Undercity to break off and form its own nation of Zaun. This is technically an equitable decision though, because at a disadvantage, the lower party could only be helped by receiving more than what is technically a fair deal. And that is politics acting in goodwill and with purposeful intent, that is throwing his weight around with power to do what he set out to do, to make people's lives better, and without the veneer of his selfishness and personal goals which clouded him so much. And it also removes the factors manipulating him. He knows it will make the council drive him out. They hate his decision and he acted without their consent. In one stroke of the pen, not a swing of the hammer, he loses his power, the pressure on him to succeed and change the world is gone, and his pleasure, well, who knows what will happen with that. But it's the sacrifice of all his life was, the defining factor of changing the world with Hextech that both gave and took away his will to live at points, and instead going to just directly helping the world with his power. It's committing to a future that is different, one of change, where the entire equation is simplified and clear, where he can focus on who he is, not what he'll accomplish. At least, that's what it should have been. We'll have to wait and see how that pans out with the next season. What we do know is that wealth and status cannot successfully make us, and that goal and ideal cannot successfully make us either. Us is the only thing that makes us purposeful awareness. To live is to be in a constant state of change, from our cells dying and splitting to our mindsets shifting and changing. We can never avoid it. If we become vessels, we'll simply change into something we don't recognize and without a single sign. Jason's story terrifies me. Those factors which contemplate the equation terrify me because change terrifies me. How am I meant to love myself when I never know myself as something solid? That's part of why I always turn to goal and ideal to this. They were guidance on who I was, a rock that was always there. But I know they're also changing me. I feel my dedication making me colder and more distant. I'm worried that when I succeed, I'll finally recognize all the changes in full and see 
how much cost really goes into chasing goals when they're so rigid. It's a sad fact that there is always a base something necessary for change. We can never make a new world for ourselves without losing something of the old one. I guess it only comes down to what costs we're willing to pay and if that cost will be who we are. And then if we're even worthy of achieving our ideals that we held once we've paid that and possibly changed. It's a complex situation, a very complex one. One, in fact, that took me 30 pages of writing to understand, and you're only seeing about 11 of those here. So as always, likes and comments are very much appreciated because they let the algorithm know you like this and they push it to more people and maybe they'll like it too, but I also love them because they are, you know, part of what helps me see series like this that I slept on for a year and a half, even though everyone told me to watch it, and they let me know that you want to see more of it, and they let me know how you felt about these characters and the ideas and if I got anything right or wrong, and they're really necessary to basically keeping me from becoming blind like Jace did, to know that I'm still doing something valuable that you like and enjoy and helping to improve it, to change that ideal so that I don't have to take all the cost. So anyway, I'll just leave with the three links as always. I guess I'll still mention Twitter, even though I will probably be leaving that very soon. Uh, there's Discord as well, and then there's Patreon, where these lovely people above me support me right now and help with that ideal and goal and everything. Prevent it from changing me, because they're very kind. But I'll just say thank you to everyone for watching and spending some time with me, and I hope that I'll see you again soon.